Hello, and welcome to Scott's Odyssey. In my travels, there's often a requirement for doing things, such as uh, tying off to a static location to prohibit myself from falling off of a cliff or through a building floor. Likewise, I often find myself in need of a quick way to secure or fasten something, whether it be a, a light to a selfie stick and camera, a water bottle to my backpack, or even some way for me to retrieve my gear once I get to the top of a tree, or top of a building, or even the top of a rock. And to do this, I use knots. More specifically, a complication with cordage, removing its smooth planar appearance and garnering an end result of something appealing in its looks or useful in its practicality. I'll explain what I'm talking about when I see you in a minute. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage. And if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, welcome aboard. Give a click on that like and make sure you also click that subscribe to support the channel. This video is a little off the beaten path, but does directly link to things I do when I'm out and about exploring Odyssey locations. As a matter of fact, the simple techniques in this video are truly important skills needed to assure basic survival and getting yourself out of deep trouble when exploring locations that are not truly what one may deem safe for exploration. These specific skills surround the tying of a rope and are used heavily in hiking, climbing, boating, spelunking, or caving, as well as urban exploration of dilapidated properties. So without further ado, let's get into it. First and foremost, my intent is to delicately yet accurately describe what a knot is. Contrary to popular belief, there is no single form of knot. Like I stated, the word knot is used only to explain that we had some cordage or a group of yarns, plies, fibers, or strands that were all nice and flat and separated. And then we put them together in such a way that it created a complication which in turn may have been something neat looking or something useful. Believe it or not, there's an entire science behind the knot to a point at which saying not is about as ambiguous as saying the color you see in a painting is just black. Let me explain a little more. When working with paint, you have many different colors that are all a subgroup of the colors red, blue, and yellow, which when combined can make any color you need even black. So following that logic, black is the only color you can see. That's if you're using the word knots to describe knots. But we all know that that's not how it works when describing colors. Similarly so, the word knot when talking about a bend, a hitch, or a loop is like saying black when you mean red, blue, or yellow in a color. And if you think that was a lot of mind-blowing information, you should ask my wife what it's like to be around me when we're talking about gravity and how it most definitely is not a force, un unless you can't get your head unstuck from the 1600s. It can sound a little intimidating or mind melting, but trust me, once you know the why, everything becomes easy and falls into place. So my intent in this video will be to give you origin and reasoning behind why you need to learn this one or five knots and what it is that made it so important for their tasks in their particular combination. Now, I want to give you a warning. Just because you saw me do this does not mean you can do it right after watching the video. Be sure to put the time and effort into learning how to create these knots so as not to find yourself at the end of your rope. First, we will go through some keywords. The parts of a rope are called the bitter end, the standing end, the working end, and the standing line. When you create a curve in the standing line, you call it a bite. 
In Old English, the word bite meant bend or angle, and in Middle Low German meant to bend. So today, it is the word that describes the curved end of a part of land or coastline, as well as the curve to put into a standing line. When you twist a bite across itself, it's called a loop. The end of the cord that you're not putting a knot into is called the standing end. And the end that you will actually knot or tie off is normally called the working end. And at the very end of the rope is your bitter end. Bitter end is a phrase that is used in everyday modern English when referring to the last part of anything, especially when it may be painful or calamitous. The origin of the phrase bitter end came from the bits or bollards on the deck of a boat to which one would tie off an anchor line. So when you would come to the end of an anchor's rope, you were at your bitter end. The bits of a boat are no different than that of horse tack, referencing the metal bar that allows you to connect the rings or ropes to either end for controlling the animal. But unlike the bits of a horse tack, the bits on a boat, wharf, pier, or quay, are the paired wooden or metal posts for anchoring or tying off your line. The cord that exists before the bitter end of the cord is normally referred to as your working end, running end, or tag end. For this video, we will say working end. When arranging a cord in such a manner as to secure a knot, you call it dressing the knot. Lastly, and at least for now, when you lay your cord out to work with it in a manner to stop it from tangling, you will lay your workspace in a zigzag method so it does not take up too much space and is set so that both ends of the cord can be accessed freely and it will not tangle, creating an unintentional knot. This process is called flaking your rope. The term flaking is based on the nautical term for when you fold a sail neatly for storage and originates as a genuine word that means to fold or divide into thin pieces, as is what is done when furling a sail. Now, we're going to stop that rabbit hole right there and we will save words like wharf, pier, quay, and furling for a future video. You see, we say a lot of things and usually believe we know what we're talking about without actually knowing the origin of the words. And that often can create miscommunication, something we see a lot of nowadays. But likewise, too much information when packed into my videos has been known to cause bleeding from the ears, nose, and eyes. And I assure you, I need you to hear and see what I'm doing while you are entertained by information that is only beneficial for self-edification or playing against your friends and family on trivia night. Back to the knots. Now it's important to know that if you tie a cord to another cord, it's called by the type of knot you made. And when you tie a cord to itself, it's called by whatever knot you made. But when you tie a cord to anything else, it's called a hitch. And whatever you hitch is called the spar. An old Norse word that uh, meant beam, rafter, or peg. The word hitch has lost its origin somewhere back in the 1200s, but what we do know is that it's any cord knot with a loop or a bend specific for temporary attachments. So with all of that information, I feel you are ready to learn the most important knots to ever learn when it comes to tying a cord or a rope. Okay. The only thing you're going to need in order to do any of this is, well, rope. So pause the video and take a moment to go get yourself a length of cordage so you can work along with this video. Length really doesn't matter. Type doesn't really matter. Just find some rope. No, really. For real, guys. I, I'll wait. Good. You got one? No. Well, that's on you but I will trust you have a really good brain for spatial analysis and can repeat what you see take place on this screen. The first knot we will mention is one that you have been tying since you were a young child. It's called an overhand knot. And although I know you already know how to make this knot, I just wanted to call it out for its purpose and because it forms the foundation of almost half of the other knots in existence. So let's go through the knot making process. To create this knot, 
you draw the working end out along your standing line to create a bite. Now, cross the working end over the standing line to turn the bite into a loop. Take the bitter end of the working end and pass it through the loop, being sure not to turn the loop back into a bite. Once you have passed the working end through, pull on the working end and the standing line simultaneously. Ta-da! You created the simplest knot ever. But now what can you do with it? Well, you could tie a package together or use it to stop the bitter ends from fraying or create a stop point in your standing line, kinda, and well, that's pretty much it. You see, if you use it alone on a cord, it usually becomes the raw form of the word not, as in meaning you created a complication with the cord, and well, again, that's pretty much it. Oh, and as I'm sure you're well aware, it is most definitely a complication. Did you know that one thing you really don't ever want to have to deal with is a knot that is not able to be undone easily? So now let's take it up a notch. What's that? Oh, take it up a notch. Well, in the early to mid 1900s, while working with machinery, people often used to wave their hand or yell to their coworker to take it up a notch. A notch being similar to a, a nick on a stick that signifies a distance or an increment or an increase. And with the phrase, take it up a notch, they were referring to increasing the levers or dials or by similar markings, nicks or even teeth on a machine, thereby typically increasing the power, the speed, or the function of the device. This phrase over time became amicable to the verb changing from take it to step it and even kick it. It also is neat to know that this is one of the few idioms in our language that actually had a converse idiom of take it down a notch, meaning, well, the exact opposite. So the next knot to be learned will be the only true knot you need to know well, the noose knot. Begin by forming a bite at the working end of the cord and turning it into a loop. Make another bite with the working end and pass it through the loop you created in the first step. Now make that bite larger by pulling through some of the standing line. By pulling on the standing end, you will tighten the noose. Ta-da! You've created a noose knot. Often you'll hear confusion between the word noose versus hangman's knot, which is like the noose knot, but with 13 more turns around the working end and with a much more heinous purpose. You see, a hangman's knot is not a noose. And you've probably been using the word noose wrong, just like the media, for many years of your life. Now you can go out and correct people for their ignorance. Sometimes you'll hear people call the noose knot a slip knot. But don't be fooled by this term either, because a slip knot is designed to release the knot with the working end being pulled. But the noose knot is designed to allow the bite to become larger and will not come undone by pulling the working end. And if you pull on the actual standing line, it'll tighten it. And the harder you pull, the tighter it'll get. It's all a matter of which part of the standing line's bite goes through the original loop on the working end. With the noose knot, you can quickly fasten and unfasten your working end of cord to any type of branch or post. And by pulling on the standing line, securely fasten the rope with no fear of it coming undone or loosening. Another very common use of the noose knot is when you're setting a snare for fish or game in the woods. If you're someone into the art of knitting, this knot is already extremely familiar to you, although you may very well call it by the incorrect name of a slip knot. Why is this the most important knot you will ever learn? Well, it is a truly useful and practical knot that you will use often when in need of a manner of doing a quick fasten or even a tie off to other structures for safety. Which brings us to the next knot, the marlin spike hitch. A marlin spike is a tool used by mariners for rope work. 
In the most simplest terms, a marlin spike is a sewing needle. The difference being that marlin spikes are typically 6 to 12 inches in length and tapered to a round or flat point. They are also typically used only for splicing, unlaying of cord, or untying a tight knot. The word marlin spike is a two-part word derived from spike, which is, well, a spike, and the act of marling, which is the practice of winding smaller cords around a larger cord. So a marlin spike is the tool used to loosen the marling. Now, marling is a word that means to marl, or to take two pieces of cordage and wrap them tightly around each other. Oddly enough, the word marlin spike was the origin of the name for the fish, the marlin, because their long swordfish nose looked like a marlin spike. That brings us back to the marlin spike hitch. Well, you just learned how to do a noose knot, right? Then you're going to be blown away by this new one because it, it's simply a noose knot made around a spar as defined previously as a spike, stick, rod, pole, post beam, maybe your backpack shoulder pad or the backpack carry strap, or literally any object that you can get around but you can't put a pre-made self-cinching loop over and tie a knot to like the noose knot. And that's also why this knot is called a marlin spike hitch and not a marlin spike knot. If you remember earlier, we identified that a hitch is whenever you tie a knot around something other than the cord itself or another cord. So let's start. Begin by passing your working end of cord around the spar. Now, pass the bitter end around the front of the working end and then back around the spar on the other side. Once the bitter end is back at the front, place it back over the working end opposite the standing line and pass it through your loop. And voila, you have created a marlin spike hitch. When you need a secure attachment to something that you're going to be putting a lot of pressure onto or dragging or pulling up to a high place, this is the noose knot variation that will give you the most bang for your buck. What? Oh, bang for your buck. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, people used to exclaim bang like a firework in order to make reference to something being a big deal or requiring surprise attention. For example, it's like saying, Johnny was just walking down the street and bang, a ball from out of nowhere cracked him in his skull. Well, in 1954, the U.S. Secretary of Defense summarized his new look national security policy to uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower as bigger bang for the buck, as well as more bang for your buck. And well, it stuck as a common phrase with the American people. So much so that in 1956, Pepsi even had an advertising campaign exclaiming their soda was more bounce to the ounce. Now back to the Marlin Spike Hitch. There's another way to do it, and it has interesting outcomes. If you wanted to, you could tie a noose knot in the middle of a standing line. As a matter of fact, you could tie multiple noose knots in the middle of a standing line. So excitingly so that you could tie multiple noose knots in the middle of multiple standing lines. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> what? Why is it exciting? Well, well, let's take a look at why. With the ability of understanding how to tie a noose knot in the middle of a standing line, and with the understanding that a hitch means to do it around a post, what happens when we have multiple standing lines with noose knots and a handful of posts to hitch it to? Well, we just built ourselves a ladder. Next, we're going to make a more proper stopper knot because, as we all know, the overhand knot is a great stopper knot, but usually, as it tightens, ends up getting smaller and passes through whatever knot you're trying to stop it from sliding off of on the standing line. So, let's learn how to make an Oysterman stopper knot which is just the knot you need to secure things from sliding along your standing line. To begin, go through the steps of making a noose knot. What? You don't remember how? But we just did it two minutes ago. All right, here we go, from the beginning. B, 
Begin by forming a bite at the working end of the cord and turning it into a loop. Make another bite with the working end and pass it through the loop you created in the first step. Now make the bite larger by pulling through some of the standing line. Got it? Now, with the noose knot created, take the bitter end of the rope and feed it through the eye of the noose. And the last part is to cinch or pull down on the standing line until it forms a tight knot. This has effectively created a large enough, but not complicatedly large, stopper knot on the working line. The purpose of this knot is to stop the cord from slipping through other knots or passing through a hole, and even as a warning that you are close to your bitter end when the length of rope is imperative. During the days of the canal and even paddle boats, this knot was often used along the length of a lead line to determine every two fathoms or 12 feet of depth. When the leadsman would check the line and reach a knot, he would call out, Samuel Clemens! Now, wait, Mark Twain! Where Mark was hitting the marker or not, and Twain represented the number two for two fathoms. And yes, this is where Samuel Clemens stole his moniker as being Mark Twain. Next, we're going to jump into a noose that does not tighten and just holds a loop in the line with a stopper knot. This one is called the bowline. Yes, I know the word is spelled bowline and pronounced bowline, but there's a reason for this. It was the rope you tied to the front portion of your boat, which is now called the bow. What is interesting is that the word Bolin is actually recorded earlier in history than the use of the word bow for your boat, but we're going to leave that for another story. Regardless, the pronunciation is due in part to the fact of wind. While the wind blew from the front of the boat to the back of the boat, if the man in the back yelled bow line, the wind would mute certain sounds and it came to the ears of the people in the front of the boat as bolan. Perhaps in future episodes, we'll delve into how this effect applies to nautical words, such as the forward of the ship being the fore, and the afterward being the aft, when we speak in maritime lingo. So the bowline knot is a very simple knot to create that leaves a loop at the end that cannot be tightened. The quick and dirty way to do this is to create a marlin spike hitch where your spar is actually your working end of the line. But I'm not just going to drop it on you like that. Let's go through the actual steps. Begin by forming a bite at the working end of the cord and turning it into a loop. Pass the bitter end through the loop like you're making an overhand knot, but continue around the standing line and then back up and through the first loop. Now cinch the knot tight. And bang! you have a bowlin. The usage of this knot is to give you a secured loop that will not tighten, slip, nor constrict in size. Many times, people will use these knots to secure two lines together. Although it works, I highly recommend against it for the simple fact that the two loops not being secured to each other leave room for rope galling. Galling is when two ropes rub together and begin chafing or wearing on one another, uh, ultimately causing fatigue and failure. In extreme weight and pressure situations, urgh, I'm not that strong, it can cause the ropes to fuse together and seize, making it significantly weaker and even brittle where they're actually connected. It's my personal belief that when people attempt to put together the loops of two bolins, they're just poorly practicing a double line connection that's called the twin bowline bend, which is a secure manner in which to tie two lines together. So with that, here's how you do a twin bowline bend. Begin by creating a bite. Now, while holding your working end against the top of the standing line, pass your bitter end through your bite. Take the bitter end of your second cord and pass it through the bite you created, under the working end, and back up through the loop on the other side, and cinch the knot. The appearance is that of a bowline knot, 
but the second line used is actually only a bend. Now, take the second chord standing line and make a loop. Fold the loop against the standing line and take your first line's bitter end. Pass it into the second line's loop under the second line's working end and back up through the loop on the other side and cinch the second line around the first line. This gives you a twin bowlin bend. Although this is not the best and easiest way to secure two lines together, it is more than sufficient in most scenarios and builds directly on the original noose knot that you learned here. So there you have it. Just by learning one extra step in the horrible overhand knot, you have effectively learned how to create five different knots that are useful, practical, easy to put into practice, and opens the doors for thousands of things that you can do with a piece of rope, like building a ladder. Let me know in the comments below if you like this video and learn some of the knots I employ while out and about on our Odyssey adventures. Be honest with me and tell me if you would rather not see this type of material on this channel, or if you would prefer a completely different channel where I only do these types of knots and explanations with small bits of word and phrase origins. Either way, click that like, click that subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next video.